Happy Friday. I'm Kawi Lucas back here at um, Think Tech Hawaii. This week has been um, quite the whirlwind with the IUCN conference in town. And uh, while there, I found a very knowledgeable and charming and articulate marine spatial planner who is now working on her second master's, this one in environmental conservation. Uh, Fatma Ben Said, originally from Tunisia, but now at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, will tell us why she's working on another master's. Welcome, Fatma. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I am pleased to be here in Hawaii, the most beautiful place in the world. Coming and from you, <laughs> that's a big compliment. Uh, you've well, lived in some pretty spectacular places like Venice, and you're from Tunisia, which has a gorgeous coastline. Yeah, that's true. But I have to acknowledge that Hawaii has this heart of environment, of nature, and not only that, this spirit of aloha and this connection and native people, and I, I just love it. Well, uh, music to our ears. Thank you, thank you. Um, we'll share that with the IUCN folks that really have, they've done a pretty good job. I mean, you've been to a lot of these conservation. Yeah, well, I, I find the Congress really successful. It was, um, very instructive, very touching, emotional, and I do believe people who attended the Congress uh, uh, came out with many inspiration, with many uh, good decisions, hopefully, and wanting to do more for our environment and nature. Um, yeah, so, so tell us about why you're back in school after going through the, the, all of the work of becoming a, a maritime spatial planner and working in the North Sea, in the Mediterranean, in the Adriatic? Yeah, so I started with architecture, but I was not convinced because those environmental impact on land. So I found this master and it was really interesting because I, I love water, I love the sea. So uh, it was my wonderful uh, subject and uh, it was also a wonderful experience uh, traveling through many places around the world. Uh, and we, we had uh, the University of Seville at the Department of Geo Geography, the University of the Azores, Department of Biology, and the University of Venice, Department of Planning. So you can see it's an interdisciplinary master. It was the first edition promoted by European uh, Commission. And uh, I, I was from the first uh, 15 students. Um, I was lucky, I think, because I've been working on uh, economic sectors, planning for, for example, oil and gas, uh, in the Adriatic. Um, I worked also on the shipping industry with the Nautical Institute, and they, I had the chance to go on ships with pilots, and it was a wonderful experience. And I worked also on uh, offshore renewable energy, wind farms in wind the North farms. Sea. In the North and Sea. Yeah, okay, that was we're going to ask, we're going to talk more about that later, but keep going. And I attended a conference, a high level conference about deep sea mining. I was scared. Scared? Yeah. Well, I think deep sea mining is going to happen. There is a need for raw materials, but the idea of going to the ocean on uh, mining the, uh, the seabed is really scaring because all those environmental impacts. Um, and let's see what will happen in the future. Um, so the, the deep seabed mining, I mean, we're pretty familiar with that here in the Pacific. Well, I don't know about everybody, but I have been to conferences on deep seabed mining too and found them kind of scary. But around the Pacific, I'm not, I'm not uh, aware of other, pla there are other places that are looking at it too. Well, I think um, all those high seas, like the, um, uh, the seas uh, outside the, um, the exclusive economic zones, so 
where is like the United Nation is governing. Um, I don't know too much about that, but they have a process, you know, going through environmental impact assessment, uh, and they they go do those uh, exploration, and then if they give them the permission, they start. But you're not convinced that those. Uh uh, I'm not convinced. Well, hopefully there's still techni techn techn technical uh, challenges and also costly. It's it's very um, very expensive. So I think it's going to take time. But if it's going to happen, and I think they already started in some areas. Um, also. Um, so you had this degree, and you realized that you would be doing what? Well, honestly, I realized that I will be helping to f with more environmental impact. So that's why I decided to do a second master in uh, environmental conservation. And knowing that marine planners, they have to work for the government, and in some cases, the government have some targets, I don't know, like doubling the extraction of oil and gas or having targets for offshore um, renewable uh, uh, electricity from renewable sources, uh, like the case in, uh, in uh, Europe. They have those targets, like 20% of uh, re electricity from renewable sources from um, wind or solar or wave or tidal energy. And all those sectors have environmental impacts. So that's why um, I decide to do this master. And hopefully, I will be able to do something for the environment and for nature and for us. So Hawaii is just beginning to look at offshore wind. Um, we, uh, as far as I know, and I'm not in the thick of things, um, uh, the planning hasn't gotten too far, um, but what are the things that we should be aware of? What, what did you see around offshore wind that was concerning to you? Okay, so um, from the economic perspective, it's expensive. It's like the cost, especially if they go far away from the cost, is going uh, to be costly. And from an environmental perspective, there are many uh, environmental uh, issues, especially on marine life, on the seabed. Uh, what, what, what sort of impacts would, would it have on marine life or so the So for instance, we have the noise. The noise. Yeah, and the vibration. And that will affect the, the marine mammals, also the fish and the larvae. Uh, so we know that marine mammals use those uh, waves to, to go to, to find uh, their ways to feed. So with those noises and vibration, they, could, they got disoriented, disoriented and uh, they, can, they can die. Also, uh, during the construction phase, we have all those noises. So imagine those big hammers, you know, to put this foundation, and they are making a lot of noises. So uh, that's it's going to, to affect the, the marine mammals. Um, also, the, the cable lying on the seabed. So that is going to affect corals or mm, all kind of life on the, on the seabed. Um, I heard one sort of positive thing about this um, this kind of arrangement uh, of the offshore oil, and that was, uh, I mean, offshore mm -hmm. wind. Um, and there's talk about, um, at least in the European community, establishing a no-take zone <laughs> around the um, wind farms. But is that is that blue washing? <laughs> I mean, if 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 it's if uh, you know, they're, the fish are already compromised, and maybe that's, you know, just like the least you can do is uh, not fish there. And how easy is it to fish in these wind farms? Do you, 
I mean, in the middle of these, do you, do you have any sense of that? Well, is it done I now? Think, I think it's mostly about um, safety issues because accident could happen, you know, in those uh -huh. wind farms. So they need, like, to keep buffer zones. And in most of the cases, they just leave, like, uh, spaces around wind farms and uh, no one can go inside, only people working on maintenance. Um, sometimes it happens, um, you know, with the crews to, 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 to collide, you know, on, on, the, on some wind turbines, you know, especially with bad weather. Um, also, there are some um, disturbance on the radar from those uh, wind turbines. So, yeah, so from the, the safety um, side, they, they will just keep it no take. But in some cases, there is like a combination between protected area and offshore wind turbines, wind farms, uh, like the case um, of the UK. Uh, they decided to, to combine those, the conservation and uh, the, the wind farms at the same area. And hopefully it's, it's going to be not harmful. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully. So back to the, um, back to um, the, I, uh, well, let's, let's stay with, with Europe since we've got you here. Um, and you were talking about some of the work you've done um, in Italy. You, you studied in Italy. And yeah. uh, so you were, working and doing mapping and um, I think I um, here we have a, a picture of um, some special maps what what are those X's well okay this map show those um, ships uh, already sunk in the Mediterranean with nuclear waste so uh, we know very well how expensive it is to dispose the nuclear waste. And some people, they just make a new business um, and it's more beneficial than drug business. Oh. <laughs> and that's what they, some of people do with the nuclear waste just to get rid of it and knowing that no one can go deeply and so let me repeat. There's nuclear waste on these ships. Yeah. And why are they marked as an X on that map? So they, they found out that there are tons of nuclear waste missing oh. and un, unreported. Unreported. Yeah. And so they did not go in this disposal area for nuclear waste. And there, are, there was some investigation about that. Uh, by some journalists that they are risking their lives and they found out this uh, people working with the mafia and um, agreeing to put those nuclear waste on ships just take it to to the sea put a bomb on the engines and the ship sank well that's really a charming story, a little nightmare of what we um, can do with our oceans with, yeah. if there's not um, a proper oversight. Yeah. Well, um, we're going to take a little break here and then come back and, and see if there's something more, more um, uplifting to discuss. Okay. <laughs> You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, meeting people we may not otherwise have met helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Aloha. My name is John Waihe, and I actually had a small part to do with what's happening today. Served actually in public office. But if you don't already know that, here's a chance to learn more about what's happening in our state by joining me for Talk Story with John Waihe every other Monday. Thank you, and I look forward to your seeing us in the future. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii.
Welcome back to Hawaii is my name. I'm Kawi Lucas here on Think Tech Hawaii. And with me today is Fatma Ben Said, originally of Tunisia and now at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who is on her second master's degree, one in environmental conservation. And that's why she's here in Honolulu attending the IUCN conference this week. So Fatma and I had a chance to, to talk about um, some of the, the more difficult marine projects that uh, she's been um, involved with in the course of her studies. And one of them is a, a, a group of islands, the Maldives. And um, you got to go there in, what was the context of that? Well, after my first master's degree, and I was not convinced to, to, to start looking for a job as a marine planner and I thought about conservation so I decided to start with volunteering and uh, the first time when I went to the Maldives you know dreaming of those beautiful islands I was shocked it was um, at the whale shark festival ah the whale shark festival yeah so the the, the islands and the ocean was extremely beautiful it was amazing but i noticed uh, the waste and the garbage you know along along the beaches and people eating and throwing some of the stuffs on on those you know on water or where where is this picture taken so this picture is in tilafushi called the trash island and uh, it was a lagoon and then they decide to dispose the waste on that uh, on that lagoon and it was growing and now it's it's a big island and it's still growing every 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 day it's growing because they're putting municipal waste in a lagoon yeah that's the disposal waste wow yeah and they don't have any system to manage the waste. They just burning. Some of the company they are just taking the plastic, and they are taking them to to India to recycle, but only plastic. And all the other stuff, they are just burning them. So this was a lagoon, as in with water inside. We're having a yeah. we're there that ship that's there. What was did that used to be in the water? Or what what are we looking at? Uh, well, this is on a local island called Mamigili, and uh, it's one of the the most developed island. They have uh, the airport. They have a big port, uh, but unfortunately, they don't have. Uh, a system to manage the waste they are just burning and knowing that the Maldives is um, expanded on, on the uh, Indian Ocean they have almost 1,200 islands so it's very wow. challenging the, to manage the waste and especially for the long distance um, and unfortunately they have just this um, incinerator to burn the waste but they are not even available on all the islands so so this is a cautionary tale for Hawaii about um, uh, uh, trash and not knowing not being uh, able to effectively reuse it so they yeah. just let these these uh, the trash accumulate on this island surrounded by water that sounds like maybe some of the the trash gets into the water. Yeah, exactly. So um, if you are traveling, you know, and going to Male, which is the capital, and Tilafushi, this trash island, is not too far. So you can see the, the garbage floating. Uh, and you can see everything. And you can see the smoke uh, from far away. So, and I do believe this is a big contributor to climate change. The uh, trash burning. Trash burning, yeah. So when you were there and we had that, we saw that picture of you and there was kind of hazy and, and smoke there, was that, was that from the incinerator? 
Is that is that what that is? So uh, they don't have incinerator there. They are just they have those piles of uh, of trash, and if you can see the 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 flat part is a lagoon. So it's like the trash floating on the water. You can see the water, but it's oh, it looks like a field. Oh, you mean that isn't solid ground next to you? That's so water. Where I am at, it's solid ground, but right next, next to, to your foot. Yeah. Yeah, so that's water. It's, with trash it's like on a it. lagoon. Do you see like oh, those postcards? That's what you mean you by see? a lagoon. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, that's 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 really horrifying. Oh, and now I see there's a ship in the background. That's yeah. I guess. Wow. Yeah, wow. you can see water. Oh. Um, so how are they how are they burning it if it's? Well. Uh, unfortunately, there are unlucky people working there, and most of them are from Bangladesh. They are not well paid. They accept any condition, and they are working there. And it is this um, island, it's an industrial island. So I believe those people working on that island are affected, and they have diseases. Mm. Mm. Well, that's why it feels so good to be going to something like the IUCN, right? Yeah. To feel exactly. like we can actually be doing something proactively about it. Have you felt that? I mean, I took some, some pictures just going around at the exhibits and stuff, and maybe we can have a look at them, because to me, I, I, I felt really energized that there was... Um, a concerted effort to bring in all kinds of uh, uh, interesting um, things for people of all ages to do. Like here, did you remember this one the, with the the kids were yeah. making little creatures, sea creatures out of yeah. clay? Oh, that was so adorable. That was in the, the um, Noah booth, and. Um, uh, just to see the kids, how excited they got. Did you play with that? Well, I, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> that is the augmented reality sandbox. And um, actually, there's a great Think Tech Hawaii show on the augmented reality um, uh, uh, sandbox. And these kids were learning how to do spatial planning <laughs> <laughs> in a site. <laughs> in a sandbox. Um, well, honestly, I would love to see kids, you know, planning their ocean because they need to, to talk. They, they, they are concerned because it's their future and we need to consider them and to involve them. Um, for instance, I'm so happy with the Papa Hanau Maukuakea and my feeling is it's going for them. And I am happy even knowing there are a lot of opposition about that decision, but let's look at the, the positive side. We need entire area, no take. We just have to, to, to enjoy those places without harming, and it's going to be for, for our kids, for future generation, and they need that. If you can see, we are keeping on expanding our activities. We want always more, and we don't think about them. And what we love to see is those kids talking about their rights, what they need in the future. They need to, to find nature. They need to find those birds. They need to enjoy the ocean, clean ocean, without plastic. <laughs> <laughs> Especially without plastic. Which is not, not that easy anymore. We were both at the, that movie um, that they showed, um, Plastic Oceans, um, which um, I highly recommend to anybody who wants yeah. a dose of reality. Um, but there were some good things in that film. They talked about, uh, was it called by pyrogenesis? The, um, that they're beginning to um, uh, find a technology to convert the marine debris into um, fuel. Well, yeah, at least something good. Instead of having this plastic uh, contaminating and polluting our ocean, at least we have something good that we can use. Um, there are many other alternatives that 
we can we can have from plastic and we people we have this wonderful mind that when we find a challenge we will find a solution so i do believe and i am hoping to to have like strong decision powerful decision at least to stop using the plastic with foods and do you remember what she said oh my god i love what she said sylvia earl this was the 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 forum with the um eleni wilhelm was moderating and what did she say let's just protect everything <laughs> not 10 percent not 20 percent not 50 percent we and we need to protect everything we need to take care of everything because nature is our capital if you think without nature, we are nothing. We are nothing. We don't have any resources. Can you think if we, we stay without water for one day, or without air, <laughs> or without green, or without seeing animals, birds? So what about the, what about the issue of taking care of the people, though? Have you, have you, do you have a good positive model that, that that we can, that we can aspire to. I mean, here we were, um, you know, in Honolulu, and there was plenty of food and plenty of clean water and plenty of clean air. But you've been in places where that's not the tru truth. And yeah. in our last minute, can you um, talk about maybe some some hopeful way to move forward that's taking well, care of the people? Too? Over here, everything is perfect compa comparing to other places, especially in third world countries where the environment is not a priority. And talking about Tunisia, they just removed the environment, uh, the Ministry of Environment. There's no more Ministry of Environment? No more, just oh, wow. sustainable development. And I was shocked when I heard that. I, I don't know. I don't know how, how could, could happen. So like in some countries, they are not considering the environment. So how about sustainable development? How is based on? So we've got our work cut out for us, don't we? Oh my God. All right, well, hurry up and finish that second degree. OK, <laughs> I will. <laughs> and then train those kids to be our, our planetary warriors. I will, I will. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>